Hey there, this is the third farm I've built in the past four years. Well, most people don't get to build their farm three times in four years, and essentially that's what I've had to do. And before I get into all that today, uh, to give you guys a little bit of context, if you haven't been following along on the channel, or if you haven't watched every video, oh, come on, you haven't watched every video? You got work to do, just kidding. My name is Josh Satin. I have a very small farm in my backyard. I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is in zone 7B. We live on a two acre lot, most of it is wooded, and we have a small market garden here. And I did farm at home for two years, and then ran and rebuilt a non-profit urban farm in 2020 and I'm back home to farm here. So today I want to talk about all the things I've learned in the last few years in rebuilding a couple of farms and what are the goals for this farm and all those kinds of things. I want to kind of start off with a disclaimer here which I put in a lot of my videos in that this is just what I do. This isn't necessarily what you should do. There is no right answer. There is no way, way to farm. This is just what I'm doing and I like to share that with you guys. What I've realized over the last few years, especially in coming up now two years on running this channel, is that I am a part-time farmer, and I'm okay to admit that. I'm not a full-time farmer. I don't make my full-time living off the farm, and I think that's okay too for a lot of you. If you have another job and you're looking to farm on the side, uh, or you need the income for your other job, that's okay. It's okay to not be a full-time farmer, and I'm happy to admit that. And so now that I'm rebuilding my farm essentially for the third time, is that I can really dial that in to exactly what I need and what I'm capable of with the amount of time that I can put in. So you might have remembered that I've had chickens and then had ducks and then had chickens here. Well, I no longer have chickens anymore and that has mainly been to simplify my life and the things on the farm and just lighten up some responsibilities so I have more time to work on other things. What I'm trying to demonstrate here and my goals for this year is really to show you the most productive you can be in the smallest amount of space and we'll get into more of those details too. I think that's something that I see on a lot of farms, especially as they start to grow in their second, third season, as they just keep adding land. And I think we need to slow down our growth a lot, and I think we need to try to grow as much food in the same space as possible. Now, I fell into that trap during my second season too, and I added a bunch more beds, and then I was neglecting beds, and they were not doing very well, and I spent a lot of time you know, fixing failed crops like replanting or getting bad yields when if I had less beds, I can really take care of that. So that's one of the things here is just having less space to manage and do really, really good job on a very small space. Let's talk about sales outlets. So to me, there's basically three ways of selling your produce when you have a market garden. You can have a CSA type thing or like a box program. You could run a farmer's market stand or you can sell to restaurants. I have not done the farmer's market thing. I've never wanted to commit every Saturday to selling at a farmer's market and I can't give you any advice or experience with that because I haven't done it. So for me, I, I did run a family box program when I first started, which was kind of my way into farming and, and getting paid for selling my produce. And in 2019, I sold to restaurants and obviously last year was different when I was at Raleigh City Farm. And I'm now just selling to restaurants again this year. Now, I usually tell people to diversify their sales outlets, but for me right now, I'm feeling pretty confident with the restaurants, mainly because I have experience with it. I know a bunch of chefs and I think, as the pandemic hopefully starts winding off soon, restaurants are gonna be really busy this summer. So that's that's at least what I'm hoping. And so I'm just gonna be selling to restaurants. And again, this is a part-time farm, part-time income. So I'm gonna be just selling to restaurants and keeping it really, really simple. So there are several takeaways over the last few years, but the biggest one for me was that everything grows better in a tunnel. And I knew that when I left here to go to Raleigh City Farm, that if I ever came back here to farm, I was gonna grow 100% undercover and that's what I'm doing this year. So all of my beds are in these, these tunnels here. And the biggest challenge for me is managing the heavy rainfalls that we have here. It also just allows you to control as much as you can with the weather, temperature, uh, irrigation, all that kind of stuff. And so things grow really consistently in here. I can make sure I get maximum yields and have consistent product for chefs. And that's a huge part with chefs. If they want like 10 pounds of lettuce every week, well, you make sure you get them 10 pounds every week. And this really helps out with that. So what I wanna do first of all is thank today's show sponsor which is Farmer's Friend and they have an amazing selection of equipment in terms of tunnels and tools and the greens harvester and I really recommend that you go check them out. I'll leave a link down below. But on a bigger note, I really wanna thank Farmer's Friend for developing tools that are instrumental in market gardening and small scale farming in general. For example, the greens harvester, which I've done plenty of content on before, is absolutely a game changer. And not to overuse that term, but it has made baby greens production possible. Their 
caterpillar tunnels were the most inexpensive and still are some of the most inexpensive and value for money that you can get for getting caterpillar tunnels and they set up super quickly i am really happy with these tunnels and i can't recommend them enough i'll probably do a longer term review about them down the road but right now i am loving them so go check out farmer's friend as i said links down below and i really want to thank them for sponsoring this channel and also just helping the small scale farming movement in general by providing things that are accessible to a lot of growers in addition to the heavy rainfalls and tunnels, one thing that I've really learned to appreciate and put in time for is proper drainage. We spent a lot of time rebuilding this farm and putting in proper drainage here. So all the water comes off the tunnels and runs down here. I'm gonna be putting landscape fabric on here, which I haven't done yet, but this is lower than the tunnels and it allows the water to drain away really well. Every farm has drainage problems. You have to figure out what they are and tell the water where to go because if, it, if you don't tell it where to go, it's gonna go where you don't want it to go. So that was another big takeaway was just managing the rainwater and having proper drainage. Having a very reliable and effective irrigation system is absolutely crucial, especially when you're in tunnel because you, you don't get any rain in here. So having that stuff set up is, is super important. At Raleigh City Farm and also the first iteration of my farm here, I had really nice irrigation systems so that if I needed to go away for a couple days, I can set a timer and you know get good coverage and not have to stress about it. So in here, we're gonna be putting in a pretty elaborate irrigation system, which we haven't come close to finishing yet and that's coming up in the next few weeks we're gonna do drip and overhead and if you can do that you really get the ultimate control and so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna have two different zones for the front and back half and then for both the drip and the overhead so these this is the irrigation kit from farmers friend I can't give you a review on them yet because I just put them in we haven't really used them yet but I'll leave a link down below for that if you want to check it out so make sure you have proper irrigation the other thing I bought was uh, shade cloth for these tunnels so we might use them, we may not, we're gonna see how it goes, but we have it in case we need it if we just get a ton of heat in here, we need to keep it cooler. Having those options to control as many variables as possible and keep your production numbers up and have the most successful crops that you possibly can, you wanna have all the things that you need to keep your plants healthy. Gardening, homesteading, and farming is very hard work and takes a lot of time and energy. And anything you can do to try to minimize your time and energy is gonna be very helpful. And for me to keep this farm as a part-time job, I need to make sure I'm not wasting time or energy on things that I can you know, get rid of essentially. So keeping your tools as close to your beds as possible. Uh, you know, I've implemented the cart and bucket system for moving compost and wood chips, which is great. Another thing is the gritter here, uh, and I'm not sponsored by Neversync, but it's a really cool tool that I'm implementing this year. I'll leave a link down below if you wanna check it out. So things like that is just, you know, trying to make the place really lean and efficient and uh, try to get things done with a minimum amount of time and energy, I think is helpful for everybody. On the topic of efficiency, another point about that I wanna make is about the wash pack station. I realized this even more so at Raleigh City Farm when I had the interns working with me there and having them wash and pack vegetables. Having a very organized, efficient wash station where people are well-trained and have equipment that's easy to use makes a huge difference in saving time. All the market gardeners spend more than half their time washing and packing vegetables. So if you can reduce that time in any way, you're gonna be helping yourself out a ton. And that is something I've definitely seen firsthand. So I've done a bunch of upgrades here. I did a video about the plumbing about this. I haven't quite finished it and I will make a future video. I'll leave a link down below for that video that I made and uh, I'll put videos down below for all the things I can think of that relate to the topics from today. This is going to be my nursery greenhouse and I know I've made a lot of videos about this lately because we've been building it. It's almost done. This is from Rimmel and it's an amazing tunnel and one thing I've noticed over the last few years which I didn't really have was a dedicated nursery. And this is, I'm really excited about this and feeling very grateful about it as well. But it's definitely something I, I, I think I've been missing. And I've been growing all my starts under lights and then hardening them off and all that stuff. But, you know, plants grow better under real sunlight. And so <laughs> that's the key here is having a nursery. And this is definitely bigger than I need for the two tunnels and probably some other activities in here like growing uh, grow bags or other small plants or maybe selling starts down the road or so, I don't know. Th th there's plenty of space in here. I'm really excited about that. Another big change I'm making in terms of propagation is I'm gonna be using soil blocks this year. And I mentioned this before and I have a couple rounds under my belt now, but we're gonna be building a nice little setup in here to build um, soil blocks. And so again, I'll make a video about that when I get that all set up and have a little more experience to share with you. But so far I've been really liking the results and really just trying to focus on getting the healthiest starts I can into the ground as possible. I'm gonna be doing a lot more composting at the farm this year. And one of the main reasons for that is we don't have chickens anymore. And so they ate a lot of crop residue and food waste from our house and stuff like that. So we're gonna be composting that all this year. I use so much compost that I have to buy commercial compost for the deep compost system, but having some compost around where we can use it in other ways, maybe in some of our flower beds or maybe some in the, in the garden beds as well, we'll see. 
And uh, yeah, so we're gonna be doing a lot more with this this year and I'll keep you guys posted about this. If you're interested in how this is built, I'll leave a video down below. Let's talk about crops and what I'm gonna be growing this year. I've been getting a lot of questions about that, especially about lettuce. So let's talk about lettuce first and then more about the other crops. So the last few years I've been growing this mix here, which I've talked a lot about, had great success with, especially in the heat. And in fact, all year round, it's fantastic. This is a mixture of Mir, Cherokee, and Magenta, which I love and did really well for me, but I don't think this is gonna do that well with the restaurants. I think they want a sort of fancier looking mix. This is a very heavy leaf lettuce, which is great for eating, but uh, this worked really great with families and some other stuff, but I'm gonna be going back to doing Salanova again. And so the mixture I'm using is what they call the, what Johnny sells as the foundation mix. So it's a mixture of green sweet crisp, red sweet crisp, green insides and red insides. You can either buy them all individually or just buy the mix. And you might be wondering why I grew this bed here. Well, I couldn't get the seeds from Johnny's for a while. So I just, I already had these seeds, so I planted them. So that's what this bed is over here. And then this will be moving forward. So again, I only have 16 50 foot beds between my two tunnels. So I really have to limit the number of crops that I'm growing this year. I did try a bunch of stuff just to get things going, but I'm gonna be whittling that down to probably lettuce, carrots, and then maybe one or two baby greens. And I'm still trying to determine what that's gonna be depending on what people want and then we'll have a few seasonal crops. So in the spring, I'm gonna do patty pan squash, which uh, we'll do a couple quick successions before the bugs come in and eat them, and then we'll move them out. And then this summer, we're gonna do the Italian sweet peppers, which were unbelievable last year at Raleigh City Farm. Definitely growing those again, and probably a couple beds of cucumbers. And in the fall, I'm not sure yet. We'll sort of see where it goes and what people want. Now, one big question I'm gonna get asked a lot also is about microgreens. I didn't grow microgreens in 2020 at Raleigh City Farm, and I'm not growing microgreens again here. And there's a few reasons for that. One is, um, I don't know, it's just, I, I kind of leaned on them a little too heavily, I feel like in 2019. And when I had crop failures, I would just grow more microgreens. And I kind of want to get better at growing these kinds of crops and shying away from microgreens a little bit. I also had restaurants that would be like, oh, I'll take this much. And then I grow for them They're like, oh no, we have plenty or we don't need it. And then you're just, you know, tossing trays and stuff. So my heart wasn't in microgreens after a while, but I think, also in a lot of situations for you guys out there, there's a lot of microgreens growers like that, like growing microgreens in your garage or basement or extra bedroom or something. Like there's a lot of people out there growing them. So in your context, it might be less competitive or more competitive. I don't know, but for me, I'm gonna focus on growing outside and, and living soil, just kind of where my heart is with all this. So no microgreens this year. I'm gonna to continue to focus on and try to improve the soil biology and soil health here at the farm. It's something that's really important as you start a farm or continue working on a farm is to focus on that for the long-term success of the farm and for the crops you're trying to grow. We put down a lot of compost to get these beds going, which is excellent. And a lot of this area, not exactly all the area, but a lot of it was where the market garden was. And so we had vegetables growing here for two years. And then in 2020, when there were no beds here, we had chickens grazing out here. So there's a lot of good stuff out here, but you always want to be trying to working towards, you know, creating that living soil. And remember, there's a few things that you want to think about when creating living soil. You want to keep the ground covered. You want to keep the ground planted. You want to disturb it as little as possible and you want to increase diversity. Well, we got the ground covered with our deep compost, our wood chips, and then having plants in the ground. And we're going to keep it planted, obviously, because we're going to try to keep all our beds full all year so we can maximize the, you know, the production and the money that we're gonna be taking in. And we're gonna disturb as little as possible because we're doing no-till. And lastly is the diversity element. I think that's one of the hardest things. And for me here, you know, I'm in the suburbs and I have some wooded areas behind me, but there's not much diversity. There's a little bit of woods and then we have the vegetables. And we do keep a small flower bed, but you know, one of the things I think that was really important at Raleigh City Farm that we did was putting in beneficial hedgerows. And this is a really old idea in a lot of places in the world. And I think it started to pick up some steam in the market gardening world. And I wanna to try to work on that a little bit more. So there I put in a hedgerow every eight beds, so eight bed blocks separated by hedgerow and putting plants in there that increase the, di the biological diversity, attracting pollinators, beneficial insects, birds, stuff like that. And so to me, a lot of what I'm looking for is to attract those beneficial insects. Those are the insects that attack the pests. So when the pests come in to try to take care of your, to eat your crops, the beneficial insects come in and take care of those pests. Now, when they're done with those pests, or if you pull that crop out, they need somewhere to hang out. So those hedgerows or beneficial plants that are nearby is really gonna be their home in between successions and things like that. So here, it was a little bit tricky. You know, I really recommend, I wanted to put 
a hedgerow in between my tunnels and open up the space here. But I wasn't unable to do that because I want to potentially leave room for a third tunnel over here and I didn't have enough room if I kept them further apart. So if you are planning out tunnels, I really recommend maybe putting a bed in between with a couple little walkways and that way you can get that diversity as close to your vegetables as possible. It wasn't possible here. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in some sort of bed here to host beneficial plants and pollinator tractors and stuff and then I'm going to put a couple raised beds, I think, right above the first tunnel just to try to get as close as possible and, uh, you know, really try to increase that diversity to try to take care of a lot of the pest issues uh, as best as possible. Again, it's one of those things that's it's not easy to measure or it's impossible to measure, but personally, I think it did a really good job and I think increasing diversity is, is important. Another one is interplanting. I just want to talk for a second about interplanting. I have green onions interplanted with lettuce here and there's a couple reasons for interplanting. One is increasing diversity, which is great. The other thing is on a small farm, wherever you can get interplanting done, you get more yield per bed. So, you know, you're talking tall crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers that take a while to get going. You can easily get a crop in on the side before they get big and overshadow them. So I'm going to be experimenting with that more this year. This is a more advanced technique about interplanting because you have to understand both crops, how they work together and their timing is, I think, the, the most crucial part. So I'll be doing more of that and keeping you guys posted. But I think that's going to be a big part of what I'm doing this year is interplanting. I mentioned expansion plans a few minutes ago, and I want to talk about that for a second here. This is potentially where a third tunnel would go. You can kind of see that it's laid out for a tunnel. we got the ditch on this side and we have a little bit more earthwork to do in the back there to get it flat. But we also have the main irrigation line runs right across here. We could tie into for water here, but I am not going to be quick to ordering another tunnel and getting that built and planted because frankly, until this is all completely maxed out in terms of selling everything out of here, I'm interplanting, I'm really dialing in all those things. There's no reason to expand. And I see a lot of farms that do this and they just want to sell more. So they plant more stuff and build more tunnels and to me, it creates more of, uh, you know, you're spending more time and energy and often stress about it too, because you spent all this money on infrastructure, maybe more employees, and then you just have to sell more stuff. So until I really want to make sure that everyone's trying to grow better, not bigger for the most part. So until I have this all maxed out, I am definitely not even considering adding a third tunnel, but I want to make sure that I have that opportunity because I think it's important when you start your farm or you think about expansion that you have the, you know, the room, the infrastructure, the irrigation water, all the stuff that you need, labor, uh, to make sure that you're gonna be successful there. So that's what's potentially gonna be happening here. Now, this is not a lot of growing space, and I mentioned that this is a part-time job for me. And I think this is kind of obvious, but I get questions about this a lot, is that my other part-time job is YouTube. And so I've been doing this for almost two years now, and pretty quickly after I started the channel, I realized this is a part-time job for me too. Um, and so I need to, you know, give myself the time to work on it because I want to continue educating and sharing other growers' stories and inspiring people to grow more good food. And it does take time to do that. And so I can't pretend I'm gonna run a, a, a full scale operation here by myself and do YouTube. It's just, it's not gonna happen for the amount of content that I like to create. And also I'm gonna be doing, continuing my work with no-till growers and we have some really big ambitious projects this year. It's gonna take up a lot of my time too. So yeah, I can't farm full time. <laughs> and so that's the reality, but I want this farm in a bigger picture sense to be a urban farm, suburban farm, micro farm, whatever you want to call it, that is really efficient, that grows the most amount of food in the small amount of space to help inspire you guys to grow more food in your small spaces or grow more food in your large spaces. But just to show you how much is possible in a very small small space here, and uh, that's what we're going to be doing here. So. This is all the stuff I've learned over the last few years in building all these farms and how I'm incorporating that now for my now round three. Big thanks to Farmer's Friend for sponsoring this video. Please check out their links down below. Thank you so much for watching. Please hit subscribe if you're not already and we'll see you in the next one.